Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to After Hours Conversations for Music Educators. We are very excited to have Mr. Bob Morrison joining us tonight. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes for our live podcast recording and webinar uh, for this evening. But before we do, I've just got a couple of general announcements that I want to go through as everybody makes their way in. Uh, first off, if you have any questions that you'd like to post to Bob or, or uh, to myself, please feel free to use the questions and answer. We don't want to use the chat function because Bob and I are not keeping an eye on that, but we are keeping an eye on the Q&A tonight. Uh, so be sure to use that question and answer. As a reminder, all of our resources are going to be available online at amromusic.com backslash after hours. So that's where you'll find all of the recordings, any links or resources that we discussed tonight uh, in the webinar or the podcast, uh, as well as the professional development letter is going to be found on amromusic.com backslash after hours. And as a reminder, recording of today's session and all of our previous sessions are available on our YouTube channel as well as wherever you download podcasts, including Google Play and Apple Podcasts. So, Bob, welcome and good evening. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a, it is a pleasure to be back in my old stomping ground of Memphis, at least virtually. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you have been one of the busiest guys. And now, listen, for everybody that doesn't know you and all of the things that you've done, I just want to rip through just a couple of things that you've accomplished over the course of your career. So you're currently the CEO of Quadrant Research, the nation's leading arts education research institution. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Managing partner for Arts Ed New Jersey, founder of Music for All, helped uh, the founding CEO of the VH1 Save the Music Foundation, uh, helped create Mr. All Holland's Opus Foundation, recipient of a Peabody and an Emmy and an honorary doctorate from the State University of New York. Man, I mean, you have committed your life to music education and advocacy. Uh, and we really appreciate you, you being on. But what I really want to talk about is what you just mentioned, uh, is your roots here in Memphis. And so you, you graduated, you went to the University of Memphis. I did go to what was then Memphis State University. Um, I was uh, an undergrad there from 1980 through 83. Um, and uh, I really in, enjoyed my time there. I was in, the, all, I was a music major. I was in uh, the wind ensemble, all the bands, the marching band, uh, in the basketball pep band. And it was a good time to be in the basketball pep band because we had a pretty good basketball team back then. Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, uh, it, no, it was a lot of fun. Doc McKay and uh, Art Thiel were, were my conductors and Dr. McKay was, uh, the head of the band program, and I think a gentleman you're familiar with, uh, old Barry uh, Trobaugh, was uh, was a graduate assistant uh, along with uh, Jerry Rains when I was uh, an undergrad there with the marching band. So, yeah, uh, those are some of my, some of the characters that I hung out with, they're still kicking around there in West Tennessee. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if I should use the term famous or infamous with some of them, but yeah, a wonderful <laughs> group of people. And uh, of course, a lot of people know you for your arts ed, New Jersey and everything, but, but you do have roots here. You know, the University of Memphis is six minutes from our store right now, just right down the street from us. So, uh, well, Bob, thank you so much for being on. And of course, we got a lot of topics we want to talk about. There's so much going on right now. <laughs> But I want to just lay a foundation. You know, there's this saying, there's a lot of variations on the quote that truth and reality are in the eye of the beholder. Bob, what are your truths and reality right now with everything that's going on? Uh, well, the, the truth is that, uh, that, you know, this is not normal <laughs> at all, right? Uh, the things that uh, everyone's going through, the uh, our music educators, our, our students, the things that they've lost uh, time being able to do, uh, particularly, you know, in the, the last three months of the school year when they were all remote and, you know, all of a sudden without warning, uh, they were tossed out of their schools. They didn't know whether they would be back or not. Seniors losing all of those milestone opportunities, concerts and musicals and uh, proms and uh, just so many things that our students lost and, and so many things that our educators lost along the way as well. And, you know, I think that one of the truths is that this is uh, a historic moment. Uh, we, we've never seen um, anything like it, you know, and people, people say, well, it's, you know, this is like the 1918 pandemic. Well, yeah, kind of, but it's not. 
because not only are we in the middle of a pandemic, uh, but we also have you know, the, a, a variation of the Great Depression and uh, the economic crisis and the people without jobs and uh, food insecurity that's going on. So you have that on top of the pandemic. Uh, and then we have a variation of the 60s civil rights movement going on right now uh, with the, the social unrest uh, ar around equity. And, and I think that uh, you combine all of those together, um, that they're happening at the same time, right? You know, what I just described were iconic moments in their own right, but were spread out. And now we've got all of them happening at the same time, which... Um, really creates a lot of confusion and, 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 a, and a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of anxiety for, for a lot of people on a number of different fronts. Uh, you know, early on in, in the pandemic, uh, I live in New Jersey now, and we were, you know, early on kind of ground zero uh, with what was happening with it. And, um, you know, one of the things that we saw was, you know, even though we were in the heart of it and we were living with it and with the numbers and with the sickness and, you know, our friends and family being impacted by this, um, you know, there were people that weren't taking it seriously. Uh, and as a result, we are now seeing what happens when something that is this significant is not taken seriously, thinking that it's going to be isolated and that it will go away in that area. And, and, and clearly that is not the case. Um, the other truth is, you know, I'm, I was like everyone else. I was hoping that, um, you know, that, that this would, would go away. I remember, you know, sitting in a Music for All board meeting in late February, right? And so this is even before any of the shutdowns or anything else. And um, uh, we were kind of looking at, well, what's happening with this and what's it going to mean for the organization? Oh, sure, they're going to have this figured out by the end of summer and there's going to be a fall marching band season. We don't have to worry about any of those things. Well, you know, today Music for All announced the cancellation of all of the bands of America, fall events across the country, and that leads into even the, the National uh, uh, Concert Band Festival into early March. And so basically they've shut down their activities until... Uh, summer Symposium 2021. Um, so by the time, by, if, if, it, if it holds, you know, they won't be bringing back any of their activities. They will have been inactive for about 15 months, at least as it relates to in-person uh, activities. So um, the other truth uh, that, I've, that I've learned in all of this, the virus is the boss. Yes. The virus is the boss. We can hope, we can think, we can pray, we can, you know, cajole, but the virus is going to do what it wants to do unless we do things to control it. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. And I, I, I think you're right. And I, it's so easy to get lost in just our day to day and all of the things right now that can create anxiety. But I mean, we're, we're living in the chapter of a history book right now. And um, I mean, people are going to talk about and write about and debate all of this for generations to come and, and we're living in it. And so I think we probably have to rem remember that and forgive ourselves when we don't have all of the answers because there's nothing comparable to this. And I know our educators have a tall task ahead. We're asking them to figure out how to teach online and how to do all of the things that, that we hope they'll be able to do. We're going to talk about that and also introduce and prioritize social and emotional learning and also address some of the, the uh, economic and the issues going on in the world. And it's a tall order right now. So um, I think your truths are spot on. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the study going on at the University of Colorado. Of course, the preliminary results came out about a week ago. They've gotten a lot of attention and everything. So for those that may not be familiar, do you mind just offering a little overview of what questions these studies are trying to tackle and really how these studies came to be? Sure. Well, the, the way they came to be, um, it started when uh, Mark Speed, who is the president of the College Band Directors National Association, CBDNA, picked up the phone and made a, a call to James, Dr. James Weaver, who is the head of performing arts at the National Federation of State High School Associations, with his concern over the fact that, you know, the people were talking about the spread of the disease as it related to touching and coughing on people, but um, he wasn't hearing a lot of conversation around what might be happening with aerosols, 
and he was concerned about aerosols as a band guy because of, you know, you know, is there a, a danger related to our instruments, and and could that be an issue that we may have to be concerned about moving forward, even though at the time nobody was talking about it. So he got with uh, Dr. Weaver. They they started to. Uh, think about ways that they might be able to convene some research. They called together, you know, about 12 other organizations. And then those organizations all agreed that having some real legitimate scientific uh, work done on the question of to what degree do, does singing, do musical instruments, do general uh, music instruments uh, contribute to the spreading of aerosols. So an aerosol are those microscopic droplets that when you speak, you, they, they come out of your mouth, they, they come out uh, with the air, but you can't see them. So they're, they're kind of invisible. And the aerosol droplet itself is not necessarily um, uh, a virus, but the droplet could carry the virus if somebody was sick with it. So the concern is if aerosols are spread, then the virus is spread out and it's lingering in the air and therefore someone may be able to may come into the area while, while it's still lingering, inhale the aerosols that are infected and then become infected themselves. So the whole idea is, you know, to what degree do we spread them and what opportunities might there be for us to mitigate the potential spread? So how do we control the spread of those aerosols? So that was what the research study was set up to do and very quickly, they raised over $300,000, had 100 organizations sign on uh, in, in probably the biggest music coalition that's ever been assembled in the United States of, of collaborating, cooperating organizations. And these organizations have uh, worked together to help raise the money for this particular project. And I'm, I'm certainly uh, proud to be a part of, of this particular work. Uh, but they went and got the, the leading aerosol researcher in the United States, Dr. Shelley Miller at the University of Colorado, to take on this study. And they then set up a parallel study at the University of Maryland so that not only would we have the research from one study, but there would actually be a validating study uh, at another institution that would say, yeah, their findings match what we're finding with this work. So they, they've now set about the process of trying to determine um, to what degree do each of the wind instruments, the instruments that you blow into, to what degree do they um, uh, accelerate the spread of aerosols beyond what you would normally see in just a normal conversation like you and I are talking here? Uh, and then the same thing with singing. To what degree is singing an issue? Uh, and then in the general music classroom, to what degree is singing uh, with our younger students? What does that look like? And then what is it looked like when they're playing recorders. So they've gone through the process in Colorado and released uh, their preliminary findings of the first wave of research uh, last week, um, uh, talking about some of those findings. And what's interesting is it's in a very controlled environment. You know, so they are going into a, a controlled chamber where they can make sure that the level of aerosols that they're measuring are the aerosols that are coming from the instrument or they're coming from the performer that it's not measuring aerosols that are just sitting in the environment um, right. because that's a, because you can go in and measure aerosols that are there but if you're measuring those that are already in the environment you're going to get an even greater reading than normal uh, in, in what you would find in the isolation chamber that they're using so uh, preliminary findings came out last week they've been doing a series of webinars uh, the they're the they put a news release out I think on Friday on their website um, at the National Federation of High School Associations. So uh, I think that that's readily available, or we can toss that into the uh, uh, chat here for people to be able to grab. Uh, but I think it's you know from my vantage point, I, I found it to be encouraging. Um, I think that the uh, the 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 findings are. Um, basically laid out the pathway for us to be able to have our programs in a way that will be safe for our students. And that's really the information that we're looking for. What do we need to do to ensure that we can uh, have these programs and operate them in a way that is 
um, as safe as possible for our students. And I say as safe as possible because we're never going to bring the risk to zero. Uh, there's no, no aspect of any of this where anyone in any aspect of education can bring the, the, the risk of spread to zero. But what we can do is control uh, the risk and, and to minimize the risk. And I think that's kind of the, the, the findings that they've, they've laid out for everybody. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I tend to agree. When I saw the findings, I thought, okay, we can do this. I mean, there are, there are solutions here that they're giving, and it should be noted, there were measurable differences, like when they masked the bell of the trumpet. I mean, there were things that when you look at it, you go, it makes a difference. And so yes. we can play and also prevent or mitigate the spread of aerosols in a classroom. So I, too, was encouraged. Yes, it's some things that we've got to proactively plan, but I didn't, I didn't leave the webinar that you hosted last week thinking, oh, man, music isn't going to happen. It was quite the contrary. It was, we can do this. We've just got to plan accordingly. Yeah, and, and in New Jersey, the, the very next day, we, we sent out a memo to every principal and every superintendent as an updated advisory to our original guidance document that went out that basically said, all right, here's the new stuff we said that was coming out. Here's what you can do and just laid out for them. Here's what you need to do with your instrumental music program. Here's what you need to do on the vocal side. And we'll know more about the vocal when the next batch of research comes out, you know, either the end of this week or early next week, but at least giving them enough guidance to say, hey, plan for this stuff, you know, because there's information that will allow uh, these programs to, to go on. And, and I've actually boiled it down into uh, really four, uh, four or five uh, simple points after go after going through all of that research and spending the time looking at it. Um, you know, being a drummer, I have to make things simple. Um, and so one of the things that I, that, that I did after going through it, the, the five things that I learned uh, that I tell everyone, and this is, these are the adaptations that we have to do with, with our programs, whether it's an instrumental program or a vocal program, First thing is mask everything. Uh, mask yourself, mask your students, mask the instruments, just put masks on everything, right? If, 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 there, if, it, has, if it has an opening and stuff's coming out, mask it. Um, the second thing is social distancing. Keep everybody six feet apart. Uh, and I think that that's been very clear uh, from the CDC guidance as well as what came out from the study. Uh, proper hygiene is the third thing not only for the individual, but for the instruments, you know, proper hygiene for the instruments and also proper hygiene for the space. You know, those are things that you can do to control things, to control the spread in that environment. Uh, the fourth, which was interesting, because this, this is one that uh, I wasn't really sure about until they, you know, stated it clearly, was you got to limit the amount of time, right? They're, they're recommending 30 minutes in, indoors, 30 minutes indoors if you are indoors with a 15 minute break uh, to allow for an air change over in the room before you bring uh, the next uh, group of students in. And then the, the last item is ventilation. You know, the ventilation of the room is really, really important. Uh, and by the way, outdoors is better than indoors. If you have the ability to rehearse outside, you can rehearse outside longer with more people still socially distanced, still masked, but you can do more uh, for a greater period of time outdoors than you can indoors. So mask everything, socially distance, proper hygiene, limit your time and ventilate. And that's what they found. We can do that. We can do that. I think when we, we all started that. this process thinking through probably at the beginning of the summer, those are the things that we were thinking. So a lot of this confirmed that we're on the right track. We're on the right track. So, so wait, wait, the, the, the one thing that the one thing that was also confirmed that none of us thought it was going to confirm or, or show we all thought that the flute was a death trap. Yes. Right? The, the, the flute was going to kill everybody. Uh, and they said, no, it actually isn't. It's the oboe that's going to kill everybody, but the flute's <laughs> okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, you know, I was, I was surprised by that too. And yeah. so the, the aerosol spread, I was with you when I was addressing the beginning of the summer, I thought we're not going to rent a single or sell a single flute this year. We're done. Nobody's starting flutes. It's, it's going to be instruments we can mask. And uh, the, the studies indicated otherwise. But again, this is why we're having these studies done. So right. you kind of mentioned a little bit about uh, what's to come. So from what I understand, this study is going on through the remainder of this calendar year. Is that correct? That is correct. 
So what should we expect from the study moving forward? Well, so the, the next thing that we're going to see is uh, more information about vocal. Uh, they just had a few uh, little bit of guidance on the vocal, but they're going to be able to provide much more guidance when they're finished with some of the vocal um, uh, music stuff this week. Uh, they'll also have more information on general music as it relates to students, student voices singing. So they're actually going to be testing with um, third graders, fourth graders in the singing environment, um, as well as recorder to see what kind of guidance that they have regarding uh, those particular instruments. So what they're doing is they're, they're doing something that is normally not done in research and science, which is they're, they're showing us their work while they're going. You know, yeah. the, that, that's why they say these are preliminary, um, but they, it, it needs to go through additional research, additional work. They have to write up a paper. It then needs to be peer reviewed by other scientists to basically check their work. And that's the whole idea behind peer reviewed science is you have to lay everything out for other scientists for them to go, uh, yeah, you did this right, or maybe that isn't done right, or maybe you need to reconsider this um, before the document is actually you know, produced uh, is, as part of scientific literature. So they've actually done us a tremendous favor by letting us inside uh, early, the early part of this and, and sharing this information. Um, but I think that, you know, we'll get another preliminary report in the next week or so. Um, and then it's probably going to be quiet uh, un until they, they start coming out with uh, the actual peer reviewed results as we get toward the end of the year. Yeah, I think you're right. And a lot of people don't recognize how unusual that is. But the alternative is, is if, if they weren't willing to let us get a glimpse of what they're learning as they learn it, we would be without big, big answers all the way through probably this year. Well, and particularly for our, our vocal music folks. I mean, the, 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 the situation that they had with the choir up in Washington uh, where they had all the problems and, you know, uh, so many people in the choir came down with COVID and you had so many people who unfortunately died, that sent everyone scurrying going, we can't sing. Yeah. And the answer is, we can sing. We just can't sing like they were singing. Right. We can't sing for two and a half hours. We can't sing in closed, poorly ven ventilated condition where we're very close to one another. Yeah. Uh, that's what they did. Yeah. And, and, and that's what they did. And that's why it became kind of a Petri dish for COVID. So now that we know what the problems were in that environment, then we can mitigate that. But with social distancing, with masks, with uh, limited numbers based on, you know, the configuration and having good ventilation where, where you're clearing the room of, uh, where you're cycling the, the air through the room at a reasonable rate and limiting the amount of time. The difference that they showed in the research between singing for 30 minutes and what the air would look like singing after 60 minutes is significant. I so, yeah, so that's why they're saying 30 minutes, done, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, now, Bob, we have a question here, and, and I don't know sure. if, if you're uh, as familiar. Mr. Mark is asking if um, during the, the 15 minutes to allow the room to the air to turn over, do they need to vacate the space or just horns down, masks on, let's stop producing aerosols for a little bit? Do you know the detail of that information? I, I think once you're done, you want to have them vacate. The, the space should be vacated for the 15 minutes before a new group comes in. Yeah. So it's not a matter of just sitting there with your masks on and you're not doing anything. It's like 30 minutes in the space, Okay, once you're done, you know, we know that it's gonna take them a few minutes to get out of there, but you wanna you know, have them uh, pack up efficiently, move out of the space and then have the space clear uh, so that it can get a, a, a fresh cycling of air through there before you bring in the next group. Absolutely. Yeah, I've talked to a few band directors already that have ordered those huge industrial shop fans and they're planning to just open their exit doors and turn those shop fans on and just try to pull as much air uh, out of the room as quickly as they can to try to. Well, and, and, and Dr. Miller was, uh, she did a session today for Texas Bandmasters who are doing their virtual conference. And uh, she was actually showing a, uh, a HEPA uh, filter system uh, or that can be used. And I think it was like $500 that could come in and could turn a 700 square foot space pretty quickly. 
Okay. Great. So, you know, in, in, you know, can, and that's for, you know, rooms that are not well ventilated. If it's not well ventilated, you know what? You can spend $500 on a thing to put it in your room that will accelerate the, the air refresh in there and you can keep going. Yeah, that's great. So again, there are solutions. We've just got to get creative on this. So, so Bob, let me ask you this, and we're going to change gears a little bit. So we're armed with this information. We've got this preliminary study. What do we do with it now as it relates to our programs, our communities, our parents? Where do we go? Well, the, the answer is you, you organize based on your circumstance. Um, everybody's circumstance is different. Um, you know, our circumstances here in New Jersey are different than what they are in Memphis right now, which is different than what's going on in Houston or Los Angeles or Arizona. And I think that what we have to keep in mind is every community is going to be different depending on where they are in, uh, in the cycle of this pandemic. But the most important thing is to, to meet with your, you should be talking to your administrators. You should be talking to them now about what is the back to school plan. Um, and if you don't have one yet, can I help? Can I, you know, put me on the team? I'll help figure out how we can, you know, come up with an opening plan that will work for everybody. And then at the same time, you'll be able to provide information about how you can uh, do music programs in, in that environment. Uh, but regardless of if, if, if you're going to be in person, uh, either full time or in a hybrid model, you need to understand your space. What are the things if you have to socially distant, distance, then how many students can you get in that space that you already have? And is that space reasonable enough for you to be able to cycle through enough students? And if it's not, are there alternative spaces that are no longer being utilized that you may be able to commandeer for the music program? I've heard of, um, I've, I've heard of uh, choral programs taking over uh, auditoriums in the high school where they're gonna actually be in the, the, the vocalists will be singing from the seats, socially distanced, spread out in the audience portion of the theater um, so that they were, are in a big enough environment where they can hold multiple people and appropriately socially distance. So you need to look at, you know, what are the things that you have available to you for your program? Um, can you go outside? You know, is outside something that's reasonable for you? You know, if, and if it is, come up with a strategy on, on how to be able to do that. I've heard of other places that are uh, focusing on, you know, trying to do outdoor learning when feasible, uh, if they're going to be in person. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, what'd you learn over the past three months? What worked? You know, what, what were the things that uh, when you were involved with remote learning that worked really well for you? Uh, and what were the things that didn't? Uh, because what you want to do is the things that didn't work, you leave those behind. The things that did work, you want to bring them forward and see how do you incorporate that into your program, not only as it relates to, well, gee, we, we're going to be in a hybrid model or we may be totally remote, uh, but how might that inf influence your program moving forward, period? How might that may, how, what, can, what have you learned that will actually make you more efficient with your time with your students? Because uh, one of the things that I often that I've been saying to educators and music and arts educators is we learned a lot about what we can do in remote learning. Uh, we also learned what we can't do. And what we can't do is we can't play together. So when we are together, we play together. You know, when we when when we're when we're together, we focus on the things that we can't do remotely. And that becomes the priority. So when you're together, whether it's five or seven or 15 or 30 students, I don't care how many there are, how many, however many are of, of them are in front of you, make music, figure out the rest after that, because that's the thing that they miss. And that's going to be the thing that will, uh, will really excite them and engage them is the ability to make music together. And we can only do that in person. So that has to be a priority. And if you're opening up remotely, then I understand there are places that are doing that, that again, what is it that you've done before that has worked for you? Or what have you learned over the summer from other teachers that you've talked to that will aid you in starting up your program uh, in a remote fashion? Yeah, that's exactly right. So 
Um, so Bob, I, I really appreciate you kind of sharing your thoughts on this Colorado study and the study at the University of Maryland. Uh, for, for those of us that are wanting to keep up, where should we be looking for the uh, next set of uh, preliminary results and information? I'll definitely keep tabs on the, the National Federation of High School Associations. You know, their website will have it. Uh, certainly CBDNA is posting it as it comes out as well, both on their website and through their various uh, social media uh, uh, groups and Facebook groups that they're a part of. So I would certainly, st uh, you know, stay on top of it there. And I'm sure, Nick, as, as soon as you have it, you're going to be making it available to your folks as well. So trying to stay as up to date as we can. There's a lot of information coming out. So yeah, we have a Google Drive and everything. We'll, we'll ensure that it gets shared around. So uh, we're armed with this information. And now I want to talk a little bit about advocacy. I, I know there's a lot of conversations about um, unfortunately cutting programs or, or changing the way programs are, are um, set up right now, the structure of what teachers are doing. Um, but I want to start with ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, because I think this really lays the foundation for the expectations of music and accessibility in our school. And, and you played a huge part in that legislation when it was passed. So do you mind just giving us a little overview for those that may not be familiar with ESSA and, and why is it even important right now? So uh, ESSA is the Every Student Succeeds Act, and it is basically the governing federal uh, education legislation. It is the successor legislation to what was No Child Left Behind, um, which is, you know, if, has forever been known as the Elementary and Secondary Education Act when it first came into place in 1965. Um, so ESSA is the current iter iteration of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And what's important about uh, ESSA is the fact that it defines uh, art and music as part of a well-rounded education. At the federal level, they've identified a, a variety of content areas that are what they are describing as a well-rounded education, the kind of education that every student uh, should have in their state and local community. Uh, and what that does is it sends a strong signal down to the states about these are kind of the priority areas that we have. And then as a result of that, there are there's funding that is tied to uh, that legislation. So whether it's Title I funding for um, our students in uh, poverty areas, whether it's Title II uh, funding as it relates to professional development or Title IV funding, which is explicitly uh, supporting a well-rounded education, those dollars can be allocated for use in music and arts education because of the way that they're defined in the law. And we're, that we're seeing more and more schools that have been utilizing some of those funds, particularly the new title dollars, uh, to be able to support uh, their, their music and arts education programs. But the, the big key, besides the dollars, is really the message that it sends from the federal government that these programs are important, so that as states are developing their own education policy, and what's important to understand in the United States is we don't have one education system. We have 50. Uh, every state really is the authority of education for their state. So it is a federal concern, but it is a state responsibility. And so it's really up to the states to define what their educational expectations are, but those definitions can be influenced by what's done at the federal level. And, and we're seeing that that is having an impact across the country. Yeah. Now, and, and ultimately for those that, not, that may not be aware, I mean, those definitions are listed in these applications that states submit to the Department of Education to get access to these funds. And people can read these applications. I mean, you can go on and say, okay, federal government, this is what you tell me a well-rounded education is, and this is how I'm going to interpret and define that within my state. This is not secret information. People can go in and find how their state defines music as part of a curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. And every state not only has definitions for what their educational expectations are, but most of them also have standards, right? So they've adopted educational standards uh, that outline what students should know and be able to do in all of the content areas, including music and dance and theater and visual art. So um, it's important to know what your state policies are. Uh, it's important to know what the standard ex standards expectations are. And then it's important to, to hold the states accountable, right? I've, I learned a long time ago that policy without accountability is not worth the paper it's written on. 
And so we really have to make sure that if we're going to say that all kids should have music, then there needs to be some mechanism to account for it, uh, to ensure that they are, 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 are being provided that instruction. And if not, there is some sort of uh, remediation to ensure that those programs are made available to students. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the dangerous assumptions that we can make at the local level is to assume that our local school boards or our principals or our administrators or whoever it is, A, A is aware of that application and have read it, and B, uh, that they recall how arts fits into that application. Yeah, there's, it, it is still amazes me the number of uninformed administrators that don't understand that the arts in the United States are... Uh, considered to be a, a core subject or part of a well-rounded education on par with math and science and language arts literacy and world languages and health physical education. So, um, it, it, and, I'll, and I'll tell you a story. We did, a, um, uh, we did our first census in New Jersey back in 2005, 2006, where we actually measured what was happening in every school. So we, we decided that, again, we didn't like the fact that there was no measurement in place, so we set up our own accountability system to figure out who has access to what. And we released a report, and our, our state newspaper was interviewing superintendents, asking them why they weren't providing the instruction that the state was requiring. And a superintendent told the reporter, well, if I would have known that I was supposed to provide those programs, they would have been in my school. And I, heard, I, I read that in the article and the, and the reporter that wrote it was telling me the story. And I'm just like, well, wait a second. If a superintendent doesn't know, who the heck does, right? I mean, they're, they're in charge of the schools. So, you know, we do have an obligation to make sure that people are educated about what these expectations are. And did you know that music and art are defined as part of a well-rounded education in the Every Student Succeeds Act. And do you know that in the state of Tennessee that music and art are required uh, educational opportunities for all of our students? That means that every school in Tennessee should be providing music and art for their students. And by, by making sure that people understand that, um, it, it gives us another step in the right direction of making sure that students have access to the programs that they deserve and the benefits from being involved in those programs that we all know about. Yeah, yeah there's no doubt that an ounce of prevention and having a conversation can really influence and make a big difference um, because there's a saying about assumptions, it's probably not appropriate for, for a professional development webinar to share with everyone, but, but we just cannot assume anything as it relates because the stakes are too high to get this wrong. Very true. Uh, that, 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 that's very true. And, and um, a friend of mine um, who's the, uh, uh, the band director at Westchester University um, told me recently, and I love that I stole it from and I'm going to use them in, in my presentation now. Uh, proactive is greater than reactive and reactive is greater than inactive, right? Yeah. So you need to be, you need to be proactive uh, to get the points across and uh, build those relationships and, you know, every time you interact with somebody is an advocacy moment. Uh, every time you meet with a principal, every time you meet with a colleague, or you're talking to a parent or a local business leader, it's an opportunity to talk about the benefits of your program, the benefits of music, the impact on your students. And it doesn't mean that you're out there, you know, reciting facts and figures every time you see somebody. So they're running quickly away from you going, oh, no, here comes the facts and figures person. <laughs> but it but it really is, you know, these are teachable moments. You know, did you know that we had three kids that made it into the, the, the region ensemble? You know, did you know that Tammy got a, a music scholarship to go to the University of Memphis? You know, did, you know, these are all little things that, you know, when you add them up, become a big thing. And, and when you add them up over time, become more impactful because then when decisions come up, well, why should we cut that program? Look at all the benefits that we've seen for our students here, so. Again, proactive greater than reactive, and reactive is better than inactive. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you're right. A lot of people envision advocacy as this huge grand gesture, but I think you're right. You know, we had Todd Shipley on, who's the, uh, the fire yeah. coordinator for Tennessee, uh, who I'm sure you've worked with with your research. And, and he gave a great definition of advocacy that really stuck with me. It's just sharing a story that's supported by data. 
And when he put it like that, you're, you're right. It's, did you know Sally got a scholarship or that we had, you know, our band had this many scholarship dollars raised this past year with our graduating seniors. That's a big deal and a great advocacy point. So I think you're a hundred percent correct. Now I'm seeing this term a lot and, and, and I cringe Bob when I hear this, but I hear directors say, they cut the extracurriculars in my school. I can't do band or I can't do music. Why, why is that nomenclature, that verbiage so important right now? I cringe when I hear extracurriculars. Yeah, I do too. Uh, because oftentimes, um, you know, extracurricular is used by administrators as code, right? Um, that this is the stuff that's not important. This is the, the extracurricular, that's the nice to do stuff. You know, the, 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 the core academics, that's the need to do stuff, right? So we need to do reading and math and science. We don't need to do music and visual art, you know, and, and some of those other extracurricular activities. So the, the one thing that I often remind people of is that music is a core subject. Music is part of a well-rounded education and that it's important that we uh, embrace that role, that we're just as important to the education of a student as math and language arts, literacy and science. Um, and I tell the story, I said um, that it, it is a, you know, we don't teach math to create great mathematicians and we don't teach language arts literacy to create great novelists and great writers. Uh, that's not why we teach those programs. And we don't teach music to create great musicians. Uh, we teach music to create great people. You know, the great musicians will find their way, but that's not why we teach it. We teach it because it's part of being a well-rounded human being. Uh, and I think that that's what we have to constantly remind people that we are on equal footing with the other content areas uh, in contributing to the well-rounded education of all the students uh, in, in our country. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a, a lot to think about there, but, but again, I think most important thing is that there, there are facts to support, there's legislation to support, that music needs to be in our schools, and we need to be talking about that more than ever right now. And, and I, I think you're right, as a community, I think when somebody refers to music as extracurricular, we've got to correct them. We've got to ensure that the verbiage aligns with what the legislation says. So Bob, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about what's to come now. We've, we've laid this great foundation and I hope our listeners are armed with some new information. Um, but I want to look ahead a little bit and talk about how we can prepare for the future. So uh, in addition to all of the impressive things that, that we talked about earlier, you serve on your local school board as well. Is that correct? I do. Yes. That's, so t tell me, what is it like to be a decision maker on a school board right now going through all of this? Well, I'll, I'll tell you two things. Uh, you know, first of all, not only am I on my local school board here, and it's a large regional school district, uh, but I'm also on the board of directors of the New Jersey School Boards Association. So in, in that role, I'm at many of these tables where a lot of decisions are being made. I was on our state's um, uh, committee that wrote our state reopening report for education. Uh, in addition to the fact that I chaired the group that put out our September Ready New Jersey Guidance for Arts Education. So, um, you know, it's allowed me to, when I ran for school board, I was hoping that it, I would learn as much as I would contribute, that it would make me a better advocate as a result of, of running. And it absolutely has, uh, because I'm at the table where decisions are being made. I can see how they're being made. I can understand what the rationale is behind some of them. And the one thing that I've learned along the way is that school board members love the arts. School board members love music programs. As in, in New Jersey, we actually surveyed our school board members and found that you know, 80, you know, north of 80% of them were involved, either themselves or their kids were involved in programs. So they're naturally inclined to be, be supportive of it. Um, but oftentimes there, there are decisions that are being made that have nothing to do with the music or the arts programs that have unintended consequences on those programs. And it's, so it's not like they're going, okay, I'm looking to do something that's going to hurt these programs. But, you know, it, there, there are oftentimes the unintended consequences. Um, but at this particular time, it's crazy. Um, and the reason why it's crazy is 
everybody has kicked the can down the hill. So the president kicked the can down the hill to the states, right? And so our state governor says, well, here are some parameters for how you open schools, but how you do it is really going to be up to you. So they kick it down to the local community and the school board. And we are the ones that have to make the decisions regarding, can we open our schools? Uh, if we can, how do we do it? How do we do it in a way that is safe for our students? Uh, and within whatever confines that we have because of facilities and, and other things. Um, how do we do it in a way that is safe for our faculty members, that they're going to feel comfortable coming back into the buildings? Uh, what about transportation? There's, there's an awful lot of whatabouts that have nothing to do with the provision of education. You know, what about PPE? What about social distancing? What about how are we going to measure, you know, temperatures when students come in? What about lunch? Can we have lunch? Uh, or is that just a breeding ground that maybe we can only run a limited number of hours during the day and just not serve lunch? Uh, you know, can we, how many kids can we safely transport on a bus? Um, what is the right distance that we can keep our elementary school students and, and have them be safe? Who has to wear masks? Who doesn't wear a mask? What about the nurse's office? What happens if somebody comes down with COVID? You know, and then what does that mean to the building and, and, and how different aspects of it may be shut down? I talk about this as being a three-dimensional chess game uh, yeah. and because that's really what it is. Uh, but I can tell you that there is a lot. The, the, the people that I'm working with are taking it very seriously. Uh, I've had the benefit of having to live this because of my own day job, you know, for the past four plus months, you know, you know, immersing myself in the research, understanding what's going on, what does that mean for how we do programs? And, and so that has benefited me tremendously. And then, you know, I've been able to be of, of help to our administration, but, you know, there's no, there's no simple solution and there's no solution that's gonna work for every district. Every district is just unique just because of the structure of their buildings and the structure of a building plays so much into the determination about what you can and cannot do. Yeah, wow. Uh, I guess the, the, the challenging thing, I mean, like you're talking about, the can keeps getting kicked down the road, is that means ultimately somebody has to make the decision and it's landing at the foot of school boards and principals and administrators. The good news though, is it seems to make room at the table for a proactive educator to get involved in the conversation and to really be a guiding direction on how they can equip their band program or their orchestra or choir, whatever it might be, to be safe within the confines of the space. So the alternative of this is we could get a mandate that answers all of our questions, but it might not be, it, it's going to be a one size fits all. And so. Absolutely. Abs absolutely. But I think there are certain things that we, that we really do want guidance on. Yeah. And the things that we want guidance on, are the things about health yeah. because we're not health experts. So it's really important that the health experts tell us what we should be doing yeah. and, and, and not be wishy-washy about it. Yeah. Well, we think you can social distance at six, but maybe three would be okay. But in some instances it may need, need to be nine or 10. I mean, don't tell me that stuff because we're not really, we're not the experts, you yeah. know, if you tell us the parameters based on health, then we can do the math to figure out everything else. Yeah. But when, it, when they're wishy-washy on, eh, maybe you wear a mask, maybe you don't, or maybe you social distance, maybe you don't, that doesn't work because that's not gonna help, that doesn't help anybody. Well, and that's where these studies come in are so vitally important because then we're getting the data that we need to make those decisions. And that, I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm not as familiar with any other, uh, activities in schools, but I don't know if I've seen anything as comparable to what the music industry and the music education edu uh, community is going through right now as it relates to getting answers to the questions that they need. So, I mean, I don't think we can understate what's going on right now and the significance uh, of that. So, uh, yeah, well, and, and I, I, I certainly agree with that. And I've seen this and, and actually we had the experience when we released our September Ready Report, you know, two weeks ago. Um, all the education groups, our school boards association, our principals association, I actually got a call from the, the president of our school boards association. He said, I had to call you because I didn't want to, I, I couldn't 
effectively communicate this in an email to you? And he just said, wow, because he was blown away by the, the depth of information that was provided to help our schools. And that's happening, you know, th throughout the arts community and particularly in the music community that, you know, we've risen to the challenge to answer the questions and make information available and to provide our educators with the tools and information they need so that they can try to make sense of what's happening in their own environment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I would encourage any of our listeners, people that are still looking for guidance, um, the, the document, the September ready document that you guys put out, I've got a stack of reopening documents on my desk and yours was one of the best. I mean, it was 140, 160 pages uh, relating just to the arts. And so it had so much good information and extensive research on virtual learning and other activities. So um, I appreciate all of the work that you've done in that. And for all of our listeners that might be looking for additional resources or guidance, you're not going to find one better than September Ready that, that you guys put out very recently. And I, ju I just tossed it in the chat there so folks can go in there and grab it if they want. Thank you. Yeah, we'll definitely put that in our resource. So I, I want to talk about positivity, being relentlessly positive. Um, because there's so much negativity right now. And whether or not we, we like to think of it, the reality is, is that for many of us, we're, we're leaders. We're leaders of our program, leaders of our school, leaders of our students, of our families, of our business, whatever it might be. What role do we need to let positivity play in all this? And what's at stake if we don't? Well, I think, you know, what's at stake is, you know, kind of the future of uh, individual programs and the future of a generation of music makers. I mean, that's, you know, that's what's at stake. Um, you know, what, you know, this is a moment that we have to meet. Uh, and we will be, you know, you talked about the fact that, yeah, this is a historical moment. And, you know, that we should be, you know, we should provide ourselves some grace because of the fact that this is a historical moment. And I absolutely agree with that. But I also know that we're gonna be measured by what we do in this moment, because people will look back on this moment 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 50 years from now, and recall what did they do? You know, how did, how did groups, how did areas approach this? And so I think that, you know, history is largely gonna be the judge of what we do, but more importantly, uh, this really is about how do we, what the future of music education looks like here in the United States, both in our own communities, in our states, and, and across the, the entire country. And I think that when you look at it in those terms, um, it's easy for us to wallow in the things that have gone away, the things that we miss, the things that we're not going to be able to do, uh, the, the you know, the, the milestones that students are, are, are going to miss out on. It's very easy to get sucked into that. And I remember having a, a conversation with John Mackey, the composer. Uh, I was on a, a session with him and he was talking about the fact that for the first month, he just crawled up into a ball on his couch. He couldn't write. He couldn't talk. He couldn't move. He was just, he was depressed. He was so... Um, just depressed by what was going on and, and, and thought that there was no hope. You know, there was no, there was no future. There was no looking forward. And then he started to come out and have some conversations and then people started to get proactive about, well, yeah, but there's, you know, we're going to need some new music. We're going to need some untraditional music. We're going to need to know how we can have a flute and a trombone and a clarinet and a snare drum, you know, play a piece together if that's all we have. So, you know, get busy. You need to start writing. And so we've seen this development of the, uh, the collaborative of the Creative Repertoire Initiative that um, about a dozen of these great marquee composers have put together uh, specifically to figure out ways to create music for the moment. Uh, and, and as a result of it, they're creating music that's going to be more interesting and engaging for students because now the students themselves have voice and choice in the process of how a piece is coming together. So that's one little insight of a, a moment of innovation that came out of a glimmer of doom. Uh, and and I, that's where I think that we have to focus not on what we can't do, but we got to focus on what we can do. Uh, and by focusing on what we can do with what we have uh, and what we've learned, that there's going to be some tremendous innovations that come about. That we, we're, We've already seen it. 
We have already seen innovations over the past three months. And I believe over the next 12, we're going to see a whole series of innovations that the result of which is going to be a new kind of uh, music education that will move forward once we come out of the pandemic, or at least once it's under control, where we're going to bring our programs back, aspects of them the way that we had them before with the new aspects that we've learned along the way to make something bigger, better, more meaningful, and more impactful for more students than we've had ever before. So I personally believe that we are at a point of immense innovation. Um, but we have to have our eyes open and be looking for it and not be in the corner, you know, sulking over what we can't do anymore. You know what? Done. Stop doing it. Get up. Look forward. Let's figure out how we how we bring this puppy in for a landing. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Well, and, and, and you know, and to your point, if we do sulk, um, it's really easy for an administrator or a school board. I think Barry Trobal joined us when, when he was on After Hours. He said, you know, the easiest thing your admin can tell you right now is no. That's the easiest response that they can give you. And so if we allow ourselves to sulk and to not have solutions to these problems, uh, the easiest thing they can say is no. And maybe that means no music. And so the stakes are high. You know, we've got to be prepared and uh, ensure that that we have answers for ourselves, but we're positive in how we reflect that. Because um, you're right. Uh, you know, we're going to make music, we're going to play together, it's going to be different. Um, but we can do this, and we will do this. And we're learning. Absolutely. How. Yeah. So, so Bob, as we're approaching the 60 minute mark here, I, I've just got really two more questions for you. What are your expectations for the upcoming school year? Um, it is going to be unlike anything that we've ever seen before. <laughs> That's my expectation. Uh, and my other one is that, you know, there are going to be some things that are unexpected. I mean, every day it's another, uh, we're hearing about another cancellation every day, uh, you know, a place that we thought was going to be opening, you know, looks like they're going to be closed or they're going to be going online. And, but, you know, I think that of, if, of, of anything, it's going to be one of adaptability that we just have to be able to roll with the punches because you know some places are going to open and the next thing you know they're going to be closed uh and and we have to be prepared for that we've told our educators you know here in new jersey you know prepare for in-person with restrictions prepare for a hybrid model that has in-person res with restrictions along with some remote learning and be prepared that at some point in time you may be totally remote and you need to be able to m move uh, with some deafness between all of those. So I think really the next year is going to be a, about our adaptability as a, as a field to a, adjust to the things as they're thrown at us. Because I, I think there's, um, you know, as, as some scientists and some health experts have said, you know, we're, you know, we're still in the third inning of a nine inning game. There's a lot more of this game ahead of us than there is behind us right now. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. We've got a long way to go on this thing. We've got a long way to go on this thing. So, so Bob, uh, any closing final thoughts or advice you want to share with us before we wrap up this evening? No, just I think that, um, you know, I think that what you, what you all have been doing down there and the, the document that you put out uh, that I know Barry and, and his colleagues put together. I thought that was a great resource to get out there to help your folks. And I think that the, the sessions that you've been doing uh, have been tremendous and the experimenting that you're doing on, you know, mitigation uh, ideas and strategies based on what, uh, what the science is telling us is, is, is really critical uh, because our educators are going to need the help along the way. And, and for our educators, um, you know, we can do this, you know, look, if we can't improvise as music educators, then, then the world's in trouble. I mean, because if we can't do it, nobody can. And I know, based on my history with music education here in the United States, I know that we can do this. And I know that, you know, even if you yourself may feel a little bit down, I've been so inspired by the way the community has come together to help each other. Uh, whether it's through Facebook groups or learning opportunities or these webinar sessions that, that folks have been having. Uh, there, is, there are people that are out there to help you. So if you need help, all you have to do is reach out. And you reach out to Nick uh, and you can reach out to me uh, if you have a question or anything or you, any of your colleagues. Uh, but there are people that will be willing to help you 
just don't be bashful, ask. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, there, there's a wise man who keeps making this saying, and I think it's so good, change the how, not the what. Is that it? Jeez, who said that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know where I got that from. Well, yeah. Bob, listen, thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of this webinar and podcast recording. But but above that, um, thank you for all that you're doing. I mean, you are just out in front. You are leading this charge. I mean, it seems like you were doing webinars every single night, just getting out, sharing, collaborating, and trying to provide answers rather than questions for all of our educators. So thank you. I mean, you've committed your career to advancing music education, and you continue to do that, leading the pack. So um, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. As a reminder to all of our educators, we're going to put all of the resources that we talked about. We're going to talk about, we're going to put the links to the studies up. We're going to put the links up to September Ready, the document that, that Bob and his team have put together. Uh, and anything else that we're talked about, uh, you'll be able to find on amromusic.com backslash after hours. So next week, we've got a great conversation lined up. We're going to have a panel of, of experienced educators who are going to be talking about ideas to start beginners before they have instruments. There's always that period of time for the first couple of weeks. We're trying to keep the kids engaged. We haven't had the instrument rental meeting quite yet. Then we're going to be talking about activities and engagement ideas uh, for students. So be looking for the sign up on that. Uh, it'll be coming to you by email. But again, Bob, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you for being a part of tonight's conversation. Uh, to everybody else, please stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next week. Good night, everyone. Thank you all.